This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. Uh, my name is Roger Zelenek. I'm host of uh, the Book Worlds program on Think Tech Hawaii. And my guest today is Robert Barclay, who is the publisher of Loihi Books. And he has just published a wonderful book by Ian McMillan uh, called In the Time Before Light, uh, which is here in front of us. And uh, uh, Robert, tell us a bit about yourself first. Uh, you're a published author yourself. Yes. Um, uh, what do you do for a living, for a real living? For a real living. <laughs> uh, what pays the bills is I'm the uh, chair of the language arts department at Windward Community College. I teach uh, literature, composition, creative writing. I'm also the advisor to their, uh, their campus's film club. So I help students make uh, short films, videos, that sort of thing. And you went through the UH Mill? Uh, yes, I went from uh, Honolulu Community College with an AA degree to a, um, a BA, an MA, and a PhD at Manoa. Oh, that's, congratulations. Thank you. It was a lot of work. Uh, you're also <laughs> the author of a really remarkable book called Melau. Oh, thank you, yes. Uh, just, just very briefly, let's tell us about that. Uh, it's a novel that deals with the legacy of um, nuclear testing in uh, the Marshall Islands where I grew up. And the novel takes place over the course of a single day uh, with a Marshallese family and some American boys who come into uh, conflict on that island. And it just deals with the struggles uh, that uh, the Marshallese have as, as uh, a legacy of still dealing with issues from the, the, the um, nuclear so testing. It's a wonderful book. It got a Kiriyama Prize, right. if I recall. And it's now being made into a movie in yeah. New Zealand. And Australia. And Australia. It's a, it's a, Two, two production company co-production deal. In so Australia we have a really cosmopolitan author. Yes, here. yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, tell me about your relationship with Ian McMillan. This is Ian McMillan's posthumous novel. Right. Well, he died about five years ago. In uh, no, he died in two thousand and eight, I believe. Two thousand and eight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what was your relationship to Ian McMillan? Um, Ian McMillan had been my advisor at, at Manoa since I had my um, bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. And then he was the advisor for my uh, master's thesis and he was the advisor for my um, doctoral dissertation. And I had taken several classes you know, from him along the way. Oh. Ian McMillan is probably uh, the most prominent uh, contemporary writer uh, based in Hawaii. He had two tracks of publishing, one in New York, he was published by Viking Press. And then he was published here, uh, several books, I think, by Mutual Publishing. Mostly. Mutual and Anoa'i Press. And yeah. Anoa'i Press. And uh, just briefly describe the kinds of books that he wrote. Um, uh, Ian wrote, um, the first book he wrote was a post-apocalyptic uh, novel that was sort of like Stephen King's, um, uh, what's his post-apocalyptic book? The, the Road or... Or something like you told that. Me. Yes, but anyway, um, he gravitated into a fascination with uh, World War II, particularly with um, how the everyday citizens living in Europe would would deal with the, these massive global forces, you know, coming in. Uh, his most famous book in in that genre was *Village of a Million Spirits*, which centers on the um, the um, prisoner uprising in Treblinka. And what he gets at in those the concentration camp. concentration camp, yeah. Yes. And what's similar to those books and this book is him trying to understand um, generally the depravity that exists in this world and why human beings do such awful things to each other. Okay. Well, well, we'll get into, into yeah. that. Yeah. What were the circumstances of this particular book? No? Um, I was thinking of starting a small publishing company um, as a just as a hobby, and uh, he um, contacted me and asked me if I'd like to publish this book. I hadn't published any books yet. Um, so this was the first book that I was offered. I published four other books before this, one of them, uh, Mark Panic's book, uh, Hawaii, a novel, won the Kapala Pala Okello Award for Excellence in Literature. So I took a lot of time and care with this book over the years, and. Finally, you know, I got it in with 2008, and so I'm finally getting around <laughs> to publishing it. But he completed it before he yes, died. Yes, it was, it was a completed novel. I just had to do, yeah. and I worked with him 
back and forth a bit discussing how to put chapter breaks and, and the, the level of editing that he wanted done to the book. So it, it's very much according to his plan and his desires for how it should come out. Um, what does the title mean? In the Time Before, Before Light. Light. It relates to um, Hawaiian legend, uh, Hawaiian mythology, um, in that there was a time before light. I think you could probably put a Western lens on it as well and, and look at us as living in sort of philosophical darkness. Um, it speaks of it in the past tense, in the time before light. Um, one might argue reading this book that we're still in that time before light. We still do horrible things uh, to each other as people. That's neat. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I've fairly well read in 19th century uh, Hawaiian um, uh, history, mm -hmm. uh, but one really mysterious period, uh, which is very little written about, which is very much the subject of this book, mm -hmm. is the period between the time that Captain Cook arrived and the missionaries arrived. Mm -hmm. And you know, what do we know about how what life was like mm -hmm. in that absolutely critical time when Kamehameha uh, unified the the, the islands? Uh, this is not a work of history. This is a work of imagination. Correct. Uh, it's very, in that sense, it's very daring. Uh, I've just finished reading it. I had a wonderful time with it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very precise about the detail mm -hmm. of Hawaiian culture at that time. It's really remarkable for that. Uh, can you tell us more about that. <clears throat> well, Ian, while it is a work of imagination, Ian was always a very meticulous researcher in his writing. Um, he had a lot of praise for that with his World War II book from um, Jewish organizations, um, the Jer Jerusalem Post um, newspaper. I'm not exactly sure what his sources are for the book, but you see the level of detail yeah, that he... It's remarkable. It's, yeah. it's a remarkable um, level of detail. Yeah. Well, we'll get back to the language that he uses a, mm -hmm. a little later, but what's the premise of the book? The premise of the book is <clears throat> a... British merchant comes to Hawaii with all the prejudices and biases and fascinations and fascinations that people of his time um, would have with the this Pacific. This is set in 1824. 1824, right? yes. Yeah. And he comes and he meets a Hawaiian man, Pono, who speaks perfect English. And in fact, one might argue that he speaks better English than Matthew. Yeah. And Matthew is at once offended and um, curious about why this man speaks so well. He thinks it's some sort of parlor trick. But the more he gets to know the man, and the man offers to tell him his life story, over the course of the novel, he realizes that Pono not only speaks better English than he does, he's smarter than Matthew is, he's more worldly and world-traveled than Matthew is, and he's much wiser and more civilized than um, Matthew is. And so that's sort of Matthew's art, discovering that this native of Hawaii, who he would assume would be something approaching a kind of ignorant savage, could actually be a better man than he is. Well, it's, it's also that conversation he has with Pono is, is set at a time in Honolulu where uh, Honolulu was, was populated with sailors on a spree. Yes. Um, and it was you know, one bar after another, and everyone was... It was a miserable time miserable for time. Hawaiians in, yes. in Honolulu. I mean, the disease that you see as we move from the chapters that focus on Pono's life history, and then when we come back to the time that Matthew is in, in real time with Pono in Hawaii, we see the disease and the misery that Hawaiians are, are going through at that time. So what is the story that Pono has to tell in the outline? We'll get into detail in bits of it, but... Pono, is, yeah. Pono yeah. is much like Ishmael in um, uh, Moby Dick. He's a witness. Um, he's a witness. He gets kidnapped by a, he's in his 20s, and he's kidnapped by this privateer who has a notorious reputation. He's feared worldwide. But a successful privateer. A successful privateer. Yeah. But this privateer's main fascination is with researching depravity as it exists around the world. He's trying to understand why people do horrible things to each other. And so he's drawn to it in this fantastic voyage that circumnavigates the Pacific Rim. And they go from one horrible human situation 
to another. And along the way, as um, this privateer Beckwith is trying to understand these conflicts, Pono is also coming to terms with why people do horrible things to each other and also seeing how it's always a few people who control the masses. It takes, I mean, we can look at our present political situation, how one person can have so much control over so many people. And I think those two things go together, which is what allows a lot of dark things to happen. There's a passage in the book that I think kind of sums this up uh, pretty well. If I could read it real briefly here. This is Beckwith, the privateer, talking to Pono. He says, we have all learned much. We have learned that we humans have much to learn and that learning itself does not shield us from ourselves. On the face of every man I have ever seen commit an act of cruelty upon another man, I have seen in the tightness of his jaw an expression of conviction of his justification and the rightness of what he was doing, regardless of the inconvenience of the obvious. And I think that really nails what a lot of horrible people do. Uh, just today, the, the uh, head of Serbia was convicted of um, war, of war crimes, not war crimes, well, mm -hmm. war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, as an obvious example. Um, where, what are the main locations where the action takes place? It starts in, I think, on the Wai'anae coast? Yeah. And then goes to China? China, it goes to North America. They're in uh, probably, um, looks like Oregon, somewhere between Oregon and, and Northern California. Okay. It goes to China, it goes to uh, Malaysia, the Philippines, um, comes, and then comes back around to um, Hawaii. Why again? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what I found fascinating is, uh, uh, at first, Pono tells the story as a Hawaiian word, as an oral history. Mm -hmm. uh, and only gradually do we realize that he's learned how to write extremely well. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one fascinating aspect to me is that when he's on board the ship, the ship happens to have a copy of the Encyclopedia mm -hmm. Britannica. When I read that, I thought, eh, come on, they don't have Encyclopedia Britannica in about 1824. So I looked it up, and sure enough, it was actually invented in 1780 and it's mm -hmm. been going uh, pretty much ever since. But he set out to not only to read the entire Encyclopedia Britannica, which was not quite as big as it is now, uh, but to memorize it. Mm -hmm. And that gives uh, Ian McMillan um, an opportunity to, for, for this man to be extraordinarily articulate and learned. Mm -hmm. and, uh, much, much more so than the, Matthew. Matthew, yeah, yeah. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. and a very clever idea. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, I thought the way he handles Hawaiian language and vocabulary mm -hmm. was quite marvelous. It's usually a major stumbling block and why a lot of books that are written about Hawaii don't make it on the mainland because mm -hmm. there's people trying to put a mean, you know, the mm -hmm. meaning in parenthesis and it's just awkward and it's like reading footnotes. Yeah. But this is really gracefully done and you, you just sort of know what he means. and. And it's a very, it's a considerable vocabulary. It's not just aloha and mm -hmm. uh, mahalo. It's a, it's a considerable vocabulary. Uh, what was that like from your point of view to read and edit? Did you, did you find that it just worked for you as well? It, it worked. There were a few things I edited um, where things were in um, quote marks or italicized. So I was trying to make that consistent throughout when you would pair an English word with a Hawaiian word. Um, so. There was a little unevenness there, but that was something I'd spoken with Ian about, and so we, you know, figured out how to you know, even that out. So okay, well, uh, we're going to take a break now, but we'll get back to some of the wonderful and okay. major scenes in the book. Okay, thank you. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii raising public awareness. You can be the greatest. You can be the best. You can be the king. Come playing on your chest.
This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha, and my name is Matt Johnson. I'm the co-host of Hawaii Food and Farmers Series. Think Tech is important to our community because it gives us an opportunity to, to tell Hawaii's untold stories. For the first time, Think Tech Hawaii is participating in an online web-based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks to Think Tech. We'll run only during the month of November, and you can help. Please donate what you can so that Think Tech Hawaii can continue to raise public awareness and promote civic engagement through free programming like mine. I've already made my donation and look forward to yours. Please send in your tax-deductible contribution by going to this website, thanksforthinktech.causevox.com. On behalf of the community enriched by Think Tech Hawaii's 30-plus weekly shows, mahalo for your generosity. Okay, and here we are again. Um, he has some really wonderful scenes in this book. Mm -hmm. um, what's your favorite scene? My favorite scene in this book is when Pono is a, is a teenager and he's having trouble spearfishing. And he accidentally learns how to see underwater by trapping a small bubble of air. And what I like most about this is it shows how intellectually curious um, Pono is. He wants to understand the, not only that he can do it, but the physics but it does behind it. To, it. to catch to catch fish, there's Octop a practical, octopus, yeah. Particularly, yeah. So he's catching fish, he's ca catching octopus. And because it is such a, a rare and unique talent, his father fears it will get him in, in trouble. So he tells him to never, never speak of it, but you know, go get us, <laughs> feel free to get us some fish for dinner. Have you tried it? I've tried it. I, um, almost every time I'm in the water, it occurs to me to give it a try. And, and we can all capture the bubble in our hand, but to get it to stick on the eye, but I could see how it's possible. But one day I will, and I think I'll have the epiphany that Pono has in, in the novel when he discovers this, and for the first moment he can see as clear as in daylight underwater. I mean, yeah, I think I'll have that same epiphany, even though I've seen with a mask before, but I think that would just be fantastic. But you do believe it's possible? Oh, yeah, I can tell it's possible. <laughs> 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 Uh, I thought some of the extraordinary scenes were battle scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they were just so um, vivid and, and mm -hmm. so personal, and uh, you really could feel the axe hitting the somebody's arm or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. There are several battles. Tell us about one or two of them. You know? Well, there's the, <laughs> the battle in the beginning with, between neighboring um, villages, and what Ian has always had a tremendous talent for is visual and sensory description. So, and, and down to minute details of someone soiling themselves, you know, in the middle of battle and having to, you know, continue on into the, the feel of someone's intestines getting slick on your hand and, 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 and impacting your, your ability to, to hang on to your, to your spill. Um, there's lots of battles in the book, and what I think we get out of all of them is how unnecessary yeah. they are. And, and that's the tragedy of human, one of the tragedies of human existence. And how really cruel the results, the consequences are. Yes, and why we do it yeah. in, in the first place, and how, also how masculine it is, how male-dominated these conflicts are. You know, the women are always on the sides, you know, supporting the men in doing this. As the story travels around the Pacific Rim, it's, it's men doing the same things from one different culture to another. I, I was struck by the fact that, you know, we're in, in talking about Hawaiian history today, uh, there's very little said about the, the uh, uh, crueler aspects of Hawaiian mm -hmm. culture at that time. And, uh, but he's very bold about it. He's very, yeah. You know, I mean, it just sounds mm -hmm. pretty rough life if you're not an ali'i. Mm -hmm. Most of the history that's being written now is about ali'i decisions and mm -hmm. policies, not about ordinary people. You know, it's just very remarkable. Um, uh, one other really interesting theme is that there's an epidemic going on at the mm -hmm. time 
they're alternating narratives, right? Right. Uh, just just uh, talk about that a little. Yeah. Uh, so when Matthew comes to Honolulu and he learns how fascinating Pono is, and he, ha he immediately wants to transcribe his life story. So he finds an American who's willing to sit down and transcribe Pono's life story as um, Pono narrates it orally. Um, and so the book itself alternates between Pono's narrative and the narrative Matthew um, going about his life in, in Honolulu and seeing things that he didn't expect, such as the epidemics, the misery. And over the course of Pono's narrative, it allows him to see the Hawaiian people in a much different light than what he originally thought, what he originally expected he would see when he came to the island. There's, there's uh, one epidemic right at the end of the book uh, when Kamehameha mm -hmm. has assembled over a thousand canoes and a whole yeah. army to go and, and take Kauai, Kauai. For the second the second attempt that he mm -hmm. and overnight half the army uh, dies of some mysterious disease. Is that actually true? I don't know if they I don't know if the book says they die, but I know that that's fairly well historically documented yeah. that that was the reason the invasion failed is they all ended up with some sort of dysentery. Um, and yeah, a lot of them did, did die. And so what Ian has done is he's, he's taken that historical data and then imagined it from a personal level and then put us on the beach. Which go, is it's also a, a symbol of the curse, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is a major theme in the book. Mm -hmm. right? uh, tell us about the curse. Yeah. Well, Pono's family, <clears throat> as Pono describes it, has always felt that they had this odd curse where at various generations, a son would end up killing the father. And this actually does happen a few times over the course of the narrative and at the end of the book. Um, Pono's life is threatened by that of his own son, who he discovers has turned into a, um, a Christian preacher who is very angry at Hawaiians who decide to remain as heathens. And so they come into conflict, and it appears as though the curse will. And rear in the, its head in the again. lore of, of, of among Hawaiians, this, this epidemic of dysentery is, is a parallel. Curse. I mean, that invasion was not meant to be. Right. You know, yeah. Was was the message. You know. Mm -hmm. um, there's another character in the book, a woman, a missionary, mm -hmm. uh, who is a pretty unusual missionary. Miss Searle. Uh, yes. Uh, would you describe her? Well, <clears throat> I think she came to Hawaii, you know, vetted as the gr the good Christian girl that she was supposed to be, and she, she and was married or not. I think she, yes, she was married and, and her husband died. 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 Yes. Yes. And then, uh, rather than trying to impose Western values on the Hawaiians, she's learned to accept certain Hawaiian values, I think, without giving up her Christianity. For example, not being, you know, this is the Victorian, was it pre, what was it, no, Victorian times? Yeah, Victorian times, where, you know, Western women, British women, would be very afraid of revealing their bodies. But she feels very free, and in front of Matthew decides to take a dip half naked in a, in a pool. <laughs> Which shocks him. Yes, shocked me. <laughs> shocked me. So she's she's very much ahead of her her time. But what's interesting about her is that she's seen the righteousness of the native perspective and the wrongness of what what is happening to them as a result of Western contact. Struck me that was Ian's own point of view most most clearly. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that that. that. Um, which brings me to another subject. It has a, this book has a very interesting dedication, mm -hmm. um, uh, which I took to have a very specific meaning. Mm -hmm. It's called "To Our Imaginations." Yes, a major issue now with um, in Hawaiian culture, and writing about Hawaiian culture, is who owns the story. Mm -hmm. uh, this this book, I think, will be a classic. Uh, it's it's. Uh, 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 It'll stand up for a very long time as a description of mm -hmm. life in Hawaii at that time. But inevitably, it's going to run into ideologues who say mm -hmm. who, Ian McMillan, as a Howley mm -hmm. writer, did yeah. not have the right to tell yes. the story. Mm -hmm. But here you have someone who has extraordinary skill, an extraordinary publishing record, mm -hmm. uh, a man of great probity, mm -hmm. um, 
uh, imagining what life was like in great detail mm -hmm. in a way that, I'm, as far as I'm aware, no one else in Hawaii right now is capable of doing. Uh, so it's a, to me, it's a really interesting uh, it, Yeah, know, and there, there will be criticism for that. And yeah. I think that's, that's yeah. just the nature of publishing a book. It, a yeah. book gets all the, the praise and it gets all the criticism it deserves. And if you want neither, don't publish a book. So um, we'll see. I mean, it just came out. So we'll, you know, we'll see what people say about it. Well, book has a really great jacket. Um, mm -hmm. uh, can, can you uh, talk about the jacket? Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful cover. This is a work of art by uh, Carl F.K. Powell, a Hawaiian artist. Um, the work of art was so easy when I designed the cover of the book. Um, I mean, the work is so beautiful that when he gave it to me, it was so easy to design the cover because all I had to do was keep the words out of the way <laughs> of, of the picture. But uh, if you go to our um, Loihi Press uh, Facebook page, you'll see a, a longer description of, of the artwork. But basically, it's the tension between trying to protect something and not destroy it at the same time. So this orb here represents something sacred, and then you have these jagged teeth simultaneously protecting it and threatening to destroy it. Well, we have to wrap this up. Sure. And uh, uh, Robert, thank you very much. Oh, and thanks for having me. This great, is great. All good luck with the book. Thank you. Uh, aloha. Aloha.